I'm Mark Seifter. And I'm Linda Zias Palmer. And this is Arcane Mark. Welcome everybody to GM Tools New Beginnings, the episode where we give you tips that help let you um, figure out how to start your new campaign. Maybe even start in, in a, a complete new game or a new edition of the game like Pathfinder 2nd Edition and give you the ability to supercharge your new campaign based on just a few things you can do at the beginning to make sure it works even better than it would otherwise. So I'd like to start off this time with the fundamentals, the who, what, when, where, why, how. And some of these things are gonna be self-evident, but I find that there's also little bits in here that are easy to forget, particularly if you're bringing, you have an established group, you're bringing in a new player or other things like that. I mean, I know I certainly didn't have this whole list myself when I was getting started out. So the first off is the who. So who are you playing with? You may already know when you're getting into a game, you may already have a group of players that are ready to play, but you may also need to do some recruitment for that. Um, so if you are, um, so that may, so you need to know how you're going to recruit. Are you going to be putting up, like, are you going to be putting up an ad in the game store? Are you going to be going onto an online forum to look for players? Are you going to be, you know, looking at some kind of a club or organization to gather players? Um, so it's good to figure out who, who you're going to be playing with. And once you know who's going to be playing, um, it's also uh, making sure that the players all know each other um, and that they have a way to contact each other outside of the game. So for a lot of groups, um, that'll be a sharing of emails. Um, you can also, if you're playing an online game, you know, making sure that you all have each other's forum handles and things like that. Because it's important that the players be able to contact not just the GM, but also each other. Because, you know, sometimes players are going to want to have those sorts of plans or conversations or, oh, wait, what did that, what happened here or things like that. Or they may want to have side conversations during the game that, um, that others may not be privy to if they're, if they're going on their own little plans or things like that. Um, so making sure that they know each other. Um, I'll also like, I've, it, this is, this is, um, this is play it comes up a little bit later in the in the organized play uh game because who is settled as soon as everyone gets at the table but there's nothing more awkward for me than sitting at a table and not knowing the names of anyone else who's there and just having to be like hey uh player of this person what what what's this or whatever so names introductions super important uh whenever they happen um so I'm gonna skip over what for the moment because what is do you actually do you have anything else for a who before I before for who in terms of who you're getting for the new campaign? Uh, who you're getting for your new game? Yeah. So um, you addressed um, a stable group, and you also addressed a situation where you don't have enough players. Mm -hmm. But some people, and they're very lucky people, and I have not usually been in this group myself actually have a large enough group of, of people or pool of people looking for a game that they actually need to select players out of that group and sometimes actually an online game can be that way because you put up hey i'm running a online game and more people by a lot may want to play that than you can actually take so one thing is you can be selective if you have more players and you can have people pitch you ideas for their characters and um, see if the players play styles fit with each other and their characters might fit with each other although players can often be a lot more fluid on changing their characters if necessary so what really matters is the play style and what the players want to play and how they want to play if those are at a fun fundamental odds it doesn't matter if like one player is playing a snooty noble and another is playing a peasant who hates nobles or that's what they were thinking at first they could change it if they need to or that could be a fun interaction but if one player sort of want, likes to solve mysteries themselves and the other player likes to be nudged along by the gm but still feel like they can solve mysteries and the third player doesn't want any mysteries or puzzles just roll an intelligence check why should i have to be able to solve these things my character is smart. I don't have to um, lift a weight or uh, swing a sword at you and stab you to show you that I made an attack roll. Then 
those are all valid players and mm-hmm. play styles, and they will not have fun together. So if you have more people, you could choose to maybe maybe even run two groups if you want. And or maybe find one groups. of them to be a GM if you because yep. you you may not have time to say the the answer to that is I'm going to run two groups. Maybe one of them encourage them to step up into the GM yep. chair. And help to mentor them through that process if they haven't yet. So that's my tip on who is also, when you're winnowing down, too often I've seen games, online games, where the audition is mostly based on the character. And they don't even get to really know the players. And then that doesn't help you the same way as you would be able to if you tried to understand play styles. So I actually do want to uh, want to go to what now because what Mark was saying there dovetails perfectly into into the kinds of notes after that. So um, the what in terms of what kind of game do your players want to play? So this both comes into this comes into the theming of the game, and this also comes into the the tone of the game. Do they want something that's more grim, dark, and gritty? Do they want it to be? If this, do they want it to be challenging on the edge of their seat? Do they want something that is comedic? Do they want something that's lighthearted? How do they want to, and do they want something, yeah, do they want something that's got mysteries and puzzles in it? Do they want something that's more hack and slash? Do they want something that's more social? All these kinds of conversations are important to have with your players because then you know that you can, first of all, you know, if you have, if you have a lot of people who are interested, you can gather together the people who are all interested in the same sort of thing to make sure that they're all on the same page. And second of all, you can tailor your campaign in a way that's going to lead to the most fun. Um, And players aren't necessarily going to think to give you like, hi, I'm a player, here's my player resume. This is what I like with games. Like, does anyone ever like go up to the GM and be like, Here's a comprehensive list of what of my likes and dislikes in a game. A lot of people um, don't know what they yeah. like. Yeah, and so by by having these sorts of questions where you prompt them, then uh, you can you can figure that out as well. Um, GM Reckless has a, a good point here. For who? For who? Varying experience levels of players can be important. Playful have been playing for decades, and brand new players can mix well as long as you have players who have patience and willing to teach. So yeah, being being a player, uh, it's very different if you have this mixed group. And then when when you're talking about uh, being willing to teach without a, being a boss or director, that's that's so important because uh, because you will need to make sure that the new players are able to make their own decisions and feel empowered and feel engaged in the game, but also um, tapping into that experience um, in order to make sure that they um, aren't feeling confused or lost, and being able to have other players that you can have help with that experience Trace. because I find that I find that new players if they're always asking all the questions to the GM can sometimes feel flustered or guilty or like oh I'm taking too much of the GM's time I'm distracting these kinds of things whereas if they have another player they can talk to then that can keep things mo- running all the more smoothly I think that's definitely true I was saying hi to Night Trace who's dropping by in the middle of a PFS scenario um, but it's definitely a challenge for um, in any time when you have a mix of players who haven't played before, and it can be very, very rewarding. You need, a just like you guys said, an experienced player who's willing to teach is not going to be bossy, but who is willing if the new player like gets deer in the headlight, looks, and then turns to the experienced player to try to give a nudge or a tip that is more like teaching them to fish than um, giving them a fish. Mm-hmm. Of like, you know, something like instead of saying, "Oh, go to this space and do this," being like, "Well, what, do, what do, if if they don't know what to do? What do you want to do? If you could get a flank for the rogue, that would add to the rogue's damage, uh, or things like that, um, could be helpful. It just depends. Sometimes the the new player looks to the GM to do that, um, mm-hmm. and sometimes some groups just let them deer in the headlights until eventually they learn on their own but i don't find that that's quite as useful as having somebody that they can trust to not take over for them but also that maybe would give them a little bit of direction when they're feeling lost and i also think that um on on a related note to that um i know we're talking a little bit more about new players but this is very important too um on a related note to that um if a new player is going to do something and you know that like there's some kind of bad thing that might happen if they do that that the new player may not know like for example uh, they sort of the the classic example for first edition is like 
they're going to do something that's going to provoke an attack of opportunity. Not telling them, like, you can't do that, but just letting them, like, hey, you know, if you do this, then if you, if you move this way, then, like, the enemy could get a swing at you or things like that to make sure that they're able to, they're able to make informed decisions as well and not feel like, oh, wait, I didn't understand that. Oh, I made the wrong decision, things like that. And Desmond's avatar points out it is crucial from the beginning to let new players mm -hmm. know this is a shared storytelling experience. Anything yes. they offer and create will affect the adventure and might craft the future of the story itself. Uh, that's definitely true. Some players have come from video games where they can't do that and they don't know that and so that changes the way they play when when they find that out so that's gonna be definitely true they, they'd be a little l bit less mechanic stick and reactive if you let them know that I, I don't know if i've if i've given sort of my standard new player pitch type thing on here before i think i may have but just the idea that the idea that when i when i'm addressing a new player about something it's it's saying that hey you know what you know, this is a this is a collaborative storytelling game. Um, you're going to be facing a variety of challenges as the as the game master. I'm going to be presenting these challenges. Um, you know, my goal is to create a fair and fun challenges that you all can overcome. Um, and you can j basically decide what you want your character to do. Um, in many cases, your character is going to be sk more skilled at different things than others. Um, each of the characters at the table has different things that they're more skilled at. Um, and you're going to be rolling this 20-sided dice and generally adding the what it says on that dice to a number that's on your sheet that represents how good you are at that thing. Um, and you can try whatever you want, and uh, I'll find a way to make that work with the story. And as we work together, we're all going to build this story together. And, um, and then you can get into sort of like the more specifics of the specific powers that their characters have and things like that. And it, so looks that's, like, that's... it looks like Jaded Tempest is saying that, uh, is agreeing the hardest thing with the newest group is that Jaded Tempest is the only experienced players and it's a battle to get them to understand they can get from point A to point B any way they like. And you know what? For some groups, they like following the rails and that is what they enjoy. And for some groups, they want to make their own thing. And some groups are just so chaotic that they want to destroy the rails <laughs> even behind them or the rails they're standing on and fall into a pit rather than um, follow even the remote possibility of a rails. We so. had a good, a good portion of our, our episode on um, that wasn't the GM tools, that wasn't the plan, was what to do when the players fly off the rails. Or burn the rails with fire or deconstruct the rails and use them to build a house made entirely of iron that's now their palace and now they expect to they expect to rule the palace so that is very true and player expectations and certain things that are some of my top tips but let's do your who what when why and how mm -hmm. because i don't think i think a lot of the things i want to say aren't in that oh yes yeah. so let, uh, once we are finished it, I will feel yeah. more, I will feel more like I can say the um, some of the other topics. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to derail that, but I was thinking that the, this is sort some of the sort of more basic stuff. That right. I was thinking we could yeah, get I, I had some more basic stuff as well, but um, if we're gonna start with this, yeah, then, sounds good. Then why don't so, we just uh, the other get thing, through it? Yeah, the other thing for uh, the other thing for what I had on here was sort of uh, content um, in terms of what your players are comfortable with. So, so, so we talked about the theming a bit before, but this is, this gets into like, you know, how descriptive are you going to be about like gore in your game? So there's certain themes that you are are or not going to be including, and I think that the Pathfinder baseline in um, in Second Edition does a really good job of setting a starting point with that. It's like you know, in Pathfinder games, we expect that there's not going to be torture, sexual violence. Um, and, and so certain other things like that, like that's not part of what we assume is going to be what your what your group is is having in there. But that doesn't mean that you can't add more things to that, right? Like you know, if you have someone in your group who has arachnophobia, and you you know, you, you you know you decide, okay, you know what, we're not going to have spider monsters in this sort of thing. Or you know, there's there's sort of the uh, the uh, the example that I see from organized play, which I think is is pretty awesome from from that perspective, is the uh, the web shooting lizard, which is the uh, which has all the same mechanics and everything else as a spider, but is not a spider, so you don't have to say spider. Um, so that that's uh, sort of sort of what I think of from that in terms of you can have the same sorts of you can have the same sorts of 
ad adventure, but you know, you then you're just avoiding that thing that's not comfortable. So, for Linda, you talked about the Pathfinder baseline, which was mentioned at PaizoCon a few times, but I think not in panels. So, you you kind of zoomed past it, and I'm I'm guessing that ninety percent of viewers or more don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. So, the idea of the Pathfinder baseline is that in the core rulebook. The core rulebook establishes sort of a simple shared baseline that you and your group absolutely do not have to follow. You can be even stricter than it. You can be less strict than the Pathfinder baseline. But just by printing something that way, when you join a new group, assuming everyone has read the core rulebook, which they might not have, but if they have, then you will know right away what part that you're not following the Pathfinder baseline or what part that you don't want to follow. Like something else that is not on that baseline that you want to also take off, or something that is on the baseline that you'd like to explore in your game if your players want to explore it. And so that is that is something we did not do before, but that I think is super crucial, no, absolutely no matter what game you want to play, even if it doesn't resemble the baseline. Because with no baseline, People meet up and are all like, oh yeah, we're probably doing a regular game. Yeah, we're doing a regular game. And then that regular game is not the same game. Yeah. So th I, I mean, think that's, that's, that's the most important part about the Pathfinder baseline. Because there's a lot of conversations online sometimes of like, well, um, we should like put tags for every possible thing that could possibly trigger any player on, on any adventure. Except then you're still going to miss something that, that triggers a different player that you didn't think of. So by having a baseline, that way, you can always note if any adventure actually strays away from the Pathfinder baseline. And a player who knows they have something that triggers them that is not in the Pathfinder baseline can just let their GM know. And so we need something that's a conversation starter. And it's something that has um, that we have added to... The core rulebook in Pathfinder 2nd Edition that was mentioned at PaizoCon, but not really extensively in a panel. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that can be a very important tool just in general for setting your expectations with your group. And like Linda said, in the Pathfinder baseline, super large amounts of gore and torture are not seen on screen generally in the baseline. It is something that a villain might do off screen, um, and then you, you deal with someone who has been tortured. But you're not going to see that happen like to the characters and the characters are probably not going to be doing it to anybody and things like that. Yeah, I mean, I had certainly had an experience where a player like decided that his character wanted to torture someone. And then the player started describing to me in graphic detail what their character was doing. And I was just like, stop. No, this is not OK. Like, you, can, it's like your care if your character's going to do that, that's evil. And, you know, OK, but. That's evil, and I'm not going to listen to a description of this. Right. And there are many tools that you can also discuss with your group um, just in case something comes up that you didn't realize or um, was an issue or that you want to... You, you think that would happen in the plot, but you want to, in a sort of very convenient way, skim over. Things like... Um, lines and veils system which is sort of an idea that is out there from from other games and game designers where you kind of just say you say we're gonna draw a line at x or we're gonna put a veil over this and um it happened but we're not gonna really talk about it a lot of groups do that for um for instance things that get sexually explicit that might happen in the game but there's some groups might some groups might play and have generations of adventurers with children, but they don't want to like role play out like graphic stuff. Mm -hmm. So they can still put a veil over that. But obviously it happened if your old character's children are in the adventure. Yeah. And Jim Rocco says, and fade to black. That's a great phrase to use for when you're putting a veil over something. It's one that people can easily grok and understand. So Desert Avatar has a really good question. Said, is it so it's generally okay to describe the character, say, venturing through an old torture chamber in general terms without getting into specifics of the implements found therein? I would say I would consider that to be fine in the Pathfinder baseline. Um, however, it's okay to do whatever you're going to do as long as your players know what you're going to do and as long as 
it's, as long as it's very clear. Like, you could say, we're going through an old torture chamber. There's all sorts of horrible things in there. You can say, um, we're going through an old torture chamber. There's an Iron Maiden in Iraq, if that's what is okay mm -hmm. with your group. You probably don't want to say, you're going through an old torture chamber, and this is where they made lemonade out of people by putting spikes into them and all sorts of other weird things. Yeah. Um, that would be bad. So, um, it just depends on what your group expects and what your group knows. Like, for instance, in one of my um, adventures at PrizoCon, the Unreality Incursion, went to a bunch of different planes, and some of them were, were not good aligned, and just legitimately were bad places that... If you even look at the description of them in Planner Adventures, are nasty and bad stuff happens. So in some cases, like they were talking to an NPC there, and what we what we did even was we were saying like as they were talking, the NPC was doing evil acts. So I, I was just saying like okay, and then she violates the Pathfinder baseline, uh, but we're not, <laughs> and then um, turns and says to you this and this and this. It's like oh, what about uh, what about this? Um, Book of the Damned. It's it's a very interesting tome that's made of angel skin. You might like it, Mr. Angel. Um, so there are ways around it. Um, and we did that there with a the sense of humor, but you can use and fade to black or just say she's doing some things in the background that are very evil. Let's not talk about them. Yeah, does this have a turf? Yeah, if you don't know new player if you if it's new players and you don't know while well, you're at a convention, erring on the side of being safer with things. And I think it's also worth pointing out that you know, Mark talked about with a with an established group the possibility of relaxing certain standards of the Pathfinder baseline or being like you know a little more descriptive. But you have things. to if get by. If everyone is okay with this, yes. In organized play, the Pathfinder baseline will the path there there is no and we're going to relax beyond the Pathfinder baseline. The Pathfinder baseline is the expectation. Right, that's what I even said. You need a discussion. You need one hundred percent buy off. For relaxing the Pathfinder baseline, and honestly, you probably should get buy-off from your group if you're going to significantly constrict it and be like, any mm -hmm. violence, including combat, is not in our game. Mm -hmm. You you probably don't need just one person who's like, oh, I don't like violence, so we can't have it in the game. You probably need a discussion with everybody yeah. before you do something where you significantly change the baseline by a lot. Even if it's to say, like, we understand you don't like violence, you might need to look for another group because we're going to have violence. Yeah, if it, if it goes so far that it... Yeah, and if you got... It, exactly, Jim Reckless. If you got young kids at your PFS table at a con, tighten that baseline right up. Yes. Exactly. That's yeah, also part That's also right. part of who. Yes. Is who are your players? Are they young kids? Is it my parents who played a game after I got a job at Paizo that they've been just watching and ruining their eyebrows for decades <laughs> and are like, well, I guess we should play this since it's your job. Uh, is it them? Because you're going to run it differently for them. Is it, um, is it a group of your close friends that you really already know? Is it a group of strangers? Um, like, what are the demographics of your group? That's part of who that we didn't really get into. Yeah, with, with yeah, with, definitely with kid, definitely with with their, if there's kids at the table, you know, I I'm gonna be running a I'm gonna be running a PG game. There's going to there isn't going to be any sort of trace of like sexual innuendo from any NPC. There's not going to be any description of there's not going to be any description of of like anything graphic. The, the violence that's described in um, in um, in combat is going to be like whoa and things like that. It's like oh and you f it's like oh and they fell into a pit in the ground and it's it's described as like a cartoon or things like that. If you are if you are going to describe it, it's just very silly. And then like you know you're not you're not portraying like real fear of the of the of the of the opposition as they're getting defeated like whoa okay okay guys we're okay now right you know Kitsune Warlock points out are you running at a church sponsored event yes. that's very true we had a group with a player who was like super duper no evolution religious and he was great with pretty much everything including the demons and devils until some party members started making deals with evil outsiders which is a classic Paizo trope that you've probably seen in their early adventures and he said he, he told me he's like look I'm fine with this. There is no problem. This is clearly a fantasy, and we're killing these evil things. But when people have to make deals with them, that crosses the line for me. And so I thanked him for telling me that, and that helped inform me for what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. 
Desmond's avatar does point out if it's your own kids, then you can uh, you know them better than anyone else. But if it's other people's children, oh yeah, you yeah. need to be as safe as possible. Certainly. Um, okay. So, so back to what? Back to. Uh, or are we done with we, what? I think, I think that We're was done what. with what. So, Let's do when. Uh, when. When is uh, so? When is first of all finding a time that works for everyone. Um, but also there's uh, there's another thing about this, which is. If you've got an ongoing group, uh, it's likely that not everyone's going to be able to show for every session. So making sure that you've, you've set up, you know, okay, I have six people in this gaming group. You know, if at least four of you show, um, then we'll run it and then everyone understands that, like, that's how it's going to work. And that, that also having a policy for what happens if someone doesn't show. So, like, if someone's not there, does their character get the full XP? Does their character, you know, is their character going to have... A chance to do like some extra downtime because they weren't there and then they didn't get a chance to get participate in other things what's the group's policy going to be with regards to um to how they're handling treasure when when people aren't there and things like that because the those sorts of things can definitely lead to frustration and friction if the group's not all on the same page for oh, how yeah. they're going to handle it and in pf2 we recommend just level people up together more or less um, because it just makes it easier to um, plan what you're doing. There are other things they're missing out on, which potentially includes treasure. So mm -hmm. let's just say if if the best treasure picks are going to the people who showed up, like leveling up and not getting any treasure picks or any other special things that happen during the adventure is not a, is not a privilege mm -hmm. um, for that person. If you're thinking, oh, this is too much for the person who didn't show up. Also... Just people have lives, and um, it's not usually their fault if they couldn't show up. Sometimes the player is flaky. You can figure out something about that. GM Reckless had a question for when, which is, how long is the game session? It is yes. a very good when session question. I agree. Considering we're like, don't punish people for having a life. So for like for our home group, for example, uh, standardly, like whenever we get treasure, we divide it by the number of by the number of total PCs in the group. And then we'll send an email to whoever didn't make it and be like, hey, you got this amount of treasure. You can buy some stuff with it in between the sessions or whatever. And we'll also consider which treasure items are best for which PCs. So even if they didn't show up to the session, it's like, okay, you know, this awesome axe is going to be best for their character. They're not here right now, so I'll use it. But when they come back, then we can, we can pass that over to them because they'll be able to make most effective use of that. And that's an example of a model that works well for our group. Um, and you can find what works well for you. Oh, yeah, treasure distribution is actually something you should figure out at the beginning because, my goodness, do some people disagree completely about treasure distribution? Like, my face-to-face -face groups have always been fairly, like, communal with treasure, but there was one group that I met that was so messed up, in my opinion, but they thought it was fine, where... Literally everything had to be divided exactly equally, and they were not really, they were just individuals and not a group. So, literally, they found a, like a plus two strength item, and it was more than a, and they had four people, it was more than a quarter of their treasure. So, that, and they, the, the fighter is like, well, I can't afford to buy this because it's more than, I don't have 4,000 for this plus two strength item. So the group said, oh, okay. And the fighter said, can I have it? Like, I'll pay you back later or something so I can do it with plus two strength. I'm saving up for a plus two strength item right now. I can't afford it. And they're like, no, we're going to sell it for half at the store for 2000 and then give you give us all 500 I would not enjoy And then the playing fighter was like, like well, I can buy it for 2000 Can I buy it for 2000 No, you can't buy it for 2000 It's worth 4000 the fighter is like, but we're all losing a lot of money as a group by doing that. He's like, no, it's worth 4000 You can't buy it for 2000 from us. We're selling it to the NPC for 2000 <laughs> And we're each going to get 500 The fighter said, hey, but if you sell it to me for 2000 you guys get 666 each. So you just literally get more, and we have the strength. I, uh, or uh, or you can wait, and I will pay 4000 No, and then they did. So, um, if it, like, there, there are groups that are very different, and I would not be a good fit for that group, as you can tell by the way I described it, but mm -hmm. some people, they're like, no, that's the reasonable thing, why is Mark talking about it like it's weird? So, you need to know how the group wants mm -hmm. to work together in certain ways. Yeah, another, another, uh, 
And another uh, little trick that we use for the communal thing is the idea that, like, if a PC doesn't have enough money to buy something, not, like, buy off of, like, the treasury fine, but just to buy something from the store, sometimes we'll, uh, we'll have PCs lend money to each other, and then we'll keep track of, like, okay, I couldn't afford this. You know, fighter couldn't afford this, so wizard lent the wizard lent them one thousand gold pieces. And the next time that money comes through, then fighter pays back wizard. And then we, we kind of do that. So I was like, okay, you know, we don't want to we don't want to have like the the raw spending money going forever more to one person. So we'll we'll pay that back. But we we work that out. So there are a lot of good things that came up while I was doing my random group splitting. For instance, um, there were people talking about. Online games, you can give a hero point for arriving on time, ready to play. And the narrative control can be a good incentive rather than the stick of taking away experience points. Uh, there's a question about how do you deal with players who just flat out leave the group due to other commitments or not enjoying it. Um, I think that's a important question. Sometimes if they're a really big part of the story, you might need to use their character in a certain way. Um, if not, try to find a good exit ramp. For their character however I guess it's not exactly a new beginning starting off question because um, unless they like come to the first beginning and then leave during that um, but it is a very important topic of um, handling unexpected things that happen um, when life happens yeah we talk about that in uh, GM tools that wasn't the plan as well um... Yeah, Tony Dumb has another uh, another way that, they, that their group does it. We use a spreadsheet that calculates how much money a PC has to spend based on their wealth, which includes items and the amount of gold available to the party. We don't really care about a balance. So, you, so you're keeping sort of a sense of that. Yeah, that's that's totally another way to do it. Yep. It's exactly. It comes down to what is your group like? How does your group want to do it? Now that that's an example of a structure that I would also be comfortable with. Um, sure. Yeah. It just depends on what you want to do, and just don't invite me to a group where you're going to do that thing I described, where you just, everyone must get an equal amount, because I like playing in groups that are a little more cooperative than that, and that yeah. aren't going to shoot themselves in the foot, all um, being like, no, we'll all defect in Prisoner's Dilemma, it's the smart move, but your RPG group, no, we defect in Prisoner's Dilemma, and we all get less, mm -hmm. it's better. Mm -hmm. Um so let's see we were still talking about when but i think we've got through most of when at this point yeah we got through most of when so where is uh because the session length we because we got the session length because people brought that up and then there's also the where is uh where are you going to run um so that so is it going to be in person is it going to be online if it's a person is it going to be at someone's house is everyone comfortable playing at that house does everyone know how to get to that house um, does everyone have a means to get to that house? Do people going to be carpooling, things like that? Teleportation. Teleportation would be awesome if we could actually do it. Um, uh, but, um... Teleconferencing? Then, teleconferencing, yes, exactly. So are you, are you going to be, uh, are you going to be teleconferencing in, things like that? Are you, if you're going to be running at a game store or, uh, or a library or another location, does that location know you're planning to run there? Is that location going to be open at, during the times you want? Are they going to be happy with your table being there? Like, have you set up... The, do you have a location that is going to work consistently and uh, not run into and not run into trouble? That is true. And also, you if you are playing with people from um, different places or teleconferencing, you have to think about, for instance, when we were running a game that was in um, in Somerville um, near Boston, and one of the players was in Vietnam because mm -hmm. she had. Uh, actually live played the jade region adventure path by actually going to asia mm -hmm. so we needed to make sure the time zone was at, um, at such a point that the where she was at was also at a place that could play at the same and time and that came down that came back down to the wind too because when you have players who are spread out um uh, making sure that you're communicating times with time zone um so that people everyone's always using time zones so you don't get confused and making sure that you select times that work well for folks I mean, when we had a player in Vietnam and a player in Sweden, we would have games where it might be expected that one of them might come for the beginning and then leave, and the other one might come for the end. I think we technically had Singapore and Sweden. All right, we had Singapore and Sweden because she wasn't in Vietnam anymore. Anyway, yeah. our player, our <laughs> players are really scattered. And they um, move around. And they move. You never know where they're going to go next. Yeah. So I think that's... Uh, do you have anything else on where? No. Uh, All right. 
So, uh, so for why is uh, sort of the we've talked about this a bit more, but it's like what do uh, what do the what do you as a GM and what do the players want to get out of the game? Like, are you, th this is this was sort of wrapped into the into the what as well, but you know. Are you are you looking for a for like a you know a chill beer and pretzels type experience? Are you looking for are you looking for something that's you know more challenging? Are you looking for something that's more uh, lighthearted? Like why are you why are you joining this group? What are you hoping to get out of it? Yep. Did you have anything else for why? Not really. Just started. because of the way that we describe it is why makes it a little bit different. Um, yeah. Oh, there was so. one other thing. Uh, why and um, why is uh, some people, if you're if you're playing specifically like an adventure path or a module that can be done um, for uh, credit for organized play, um, figuring out like, hey, do people want to do that? Uh, are people playing that in part for for that credit? And what are they hoping to get out of that in that regard? Um, so the why is kind of eaten up in the other ones. Honestly, it's mainly on here because I didn't want to have one of the who, what, when, where, why, how that I didn't ask for for sake of thoroughness. Um, and then the how is um, what tools are you going to use? So are you going to be using, or if you're going to be playing online, which, uh, which kind of virtual tabletop are you going to use, if any? How, what kind of chat programs might you be using? Um, are, you going to, are the players going to be bringing their own minis, or are you going to be providing the minis? Same thing with the dice. Like, how are you going to be getting all the tools together? Does everyone have access to all the tools? And making sure that that's all set up and people know how to use what you're going to use. Um, also to that is um, sources that are allowed. So um, is it is it anything goes, any book you want? Is it, you know, we're going to use just the core rule book and, and the advanced player's guide and no other sources? Are you going to be including third party sources for, for the game? And which third party sources are you going to be including? You know, are you going to have a thing where it's like, okay, I'm familiar with what's in the core rule book. If it's not in the core rule book, run it past me. Um, being clear about what kind of sources you're going to be using. And then um, also on that general note, what are your house rules going to be for the game? And setting those down and making sure that folks are good with those. Yep. So that was, uh, that that was, was my... That. That was my who, what, when, where, why, how list that I set up for this. So okay. I know you have plenty of other things you want to That's discuss. That's true. I just didn't feel like they fit into the who, what, when, where, why, how. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about session zero and how it can improve your game. So we sort of started with the who, what, when, where, how, I, how. But the question is, how, not just how for the game, but how do you ask people about who, what, when, where, how, why, how? How do you do any of this communication organization that just a little sprinkle of it at the beginning of the game can make hundreds of hours that you potentially spend later uh, better and more enriched. And one way that people do it is by something that they, they sometimes call session zero, where you just get everyone together and talk. And not just you on one-on-ones with each person trying to figure it out beforehand, but just have everybody there and talk. And honestly, we are so far apart from everybody else that we don't always have the chance to do that, but we, we can substitute sometimes with our group with knowing them already and some very, very extensive and interconnected back-to-back -back chats and emails. Um, mm -hmm. But you need something that is connected and where you can work together and respond to the ideas and responses of everyone in the group. Figure out what their expectations are. Figure out what they like. Figure out even, like, I gave an example earlier in this show about the group where um, one person wants to solve puzzles and mysteries on their own. One wants to um, have a, uh, some hints and prodding by the GM. But then in the end, like, they did it. And the other one thinks, this is garbage. My character should roll an intelligence check. And those first two people, if you don't go beyond a surface level of talking to them about it, might just say, I like puzzles. Mm -hmm. And then they're at a serious issue with each other later on. The third one is going to tell you they hate it. Um, and you'll know. But you could have a group that's split 50-50 between those first two things, and then you have a problem. Because the hardcore people, they, they want it. they're okay if it took three hours to solve it. Mm -hmm. And the other half of the people are getting super frustrated because they think if you gave them a little hint, 
they would be able to go to the next step of the of the puzzle. I once had a I once had a ridiculously complicated physical puzzle in a game because I knew that first of all there was an opportunity for a puzzle and second of all I was going to be running a short session with only three uh, a very short table session with only three players who were all really into puzzles. So I was like, okay, I can still run the session and I can make this the session that's mainly about this puzzle that I spent many hours to design. But that yep. was because I knew the players and I knew their interests, and then they were all super stoked to do that. And funnily enough, it was for Console Thieves in mm -hmm. an adventure that was um, specifically just gave in checks and mm -hmm. had a foreword that indicated that James Jacobs is one of the type three of the three that we said. It was like, I don't like puzzles, just let them roll a, um, a skill check because this is my character and not me. So... There's all sorts of different people with respect to puzzles, and that's just one of a huge number of different topics of things that could show up in your game. Mm -hmm. There's people who just want to murder everything that, that they come into a room with, especially if it is not human. And there's people who want to try to make friends with everything possible. And those people are going to get really aggravated if they're in the same group with each other, because... I mean, I usually want to make friends with pretty much everything. I was in a Giant Slayer game, so I decided that my druid would try to follow Torag's Paladin's Code, but it was still, Torag's Paladin's Code is a little too evil for me. <laughs> um, but at least it helps me not want to make friends with everyone, because it's like, it's really bad. I don't know if you guys know Torag's Paladin's Code, but you have to like wipe out the enemies of your people, because otherwise they could pose a threat to you later on. Um, so, you really need to know a lot of things, and as the GM, if you're running a published adventure, you know what themes you need to ask about. If you're just going to make up your own adventure, which is what I did for a long time before I started running some published adventures with, with our group, you can just sort of do what you hear from the players and what there's consensus in, which is very, very helpful. And for me, what I like to use the, um, the beginning sort of the Session Zero-esque, although I often do it behind the scenes in case people want to tell me things that are secrets about their character, is figure out what people are interested in playing in general. Um, with an AP, I let them read the player's guide, and then I, um, I help them to create a character that's even more tied into the adventure what the, than their sort of less specific character was. So, like, for instance, for example... Uh, I had a player who was looking at the adventure path for War for the Crimes, like, I want to be from a noble family, and I want to just be kind of angry at that family, and just generally, I like the peasantry and dislike my family. So I looked through, I gave him some choices, and in the end, we were like, okay, yeah, you're going to be from the Lothied family, it's going to be great, and it worked out pretty well. Or um, in Jade Regent, I had a player who really wanted to play a sylph. So I asked her if it was okay if her character's father like researched up in the northern reaches. Uh, because I knew that that would, that would have a minor connection at some point in the AP and would be cooler. And that player probably didn't have an idea for what her father was. So um, basically, um, basically, when players have a general idea and come to me with it, or come to you with it, if you follow this approach, you can actually hook them into the story in a really major way. Uh, and um, Vikingoth says, uh, Lothids are a... Um, yes, Lothids are a... Definitely, that, that's a I'm you... not going to give the spoiler for War for the Crown there, but yes, they are definitely an important family, as you will learn even just... I think maybe literally from the player's guide of War for the Crown, but if not, yeah, I think so. I think it's just in the player's guide that the person who, um, the person who sort of hires you at the beginning of the adventure path, and is the first thing that happens in the adventure path too, so it's not a spoiler, is like the bastard daughter of the Lothied family. So, uh, we had a legitimate Lothied uh, as well, and it was a very interesting interaction, and it worked very well for our group, and might work well for yours. Mm -hmm. But um, the point about that is, 
if I didn't talk to that player at all, he might have come in and just he would have picked one of the noble families at random. And he did want to play a wizard, which also fit with the Lothid family's reputation for arcane magic. But um, doing uh, a session zero or a lot of communication, really, I feel that the communication I did at the beginning where I hook people in and like Linda's character is a dwarven smith who her um her sister works at the forges um in Zimar for um um High Stratagos Pytherius who is mm -hmm. another political figure and just being able to hook people in like that just I think may enriches the adventure path a lot and it's something you can only do if you um get in discussions with the players at the beginning and then, and then, you know, we can also have that conversation where, because, like, Mark, for example, knows that, you know, I wouldn't want to see bad things happening to, like, the families of my characters and certain things like that. So then he, because he knows where, where my boundaries are, then, then he can decide to craft the way that the stories will work in a way that is going to be fun for me. Yep, and I warned her that there was one point in the adventure path where a ruthless... Um, a ruthless killer might actually use her character's sister um, against the PCs in, when they're in a game of cat and mouse with that character, um, but that there was no foregone conclusions and um, that there was a lot of opportunity for resurrection in the adventure path, and Linda said that was all right. Yeah, so and we worked it they out. avoided it. Mm -hmm. Although her sister now thinks that um, they... Linda's character sent an assassin that failed after her, but, um... That, that, I don't think that relationship is gonna ever repair. It's kind of hilarious. <laughs> Alright, so Kitsune Warlock has a question. This looks like as good a place as any to ask. I love collaborative character creation during Session Zero. The clear step-by-step -step character creation process from 2E gives me an additional incentive to encourage collaborative character creation. I've heard at least one player who's had bad experiences in the past. Just prefers to make the character at home, but never got details. Have you encountered any negatives to character creation during a session zero? And what's the best way? To prevent that, presumably? I don't know. It just stops at saying what's the best way. Um, um Maybe it's what's the best way to encounter negatives uh, or, to character creation? Yeah, I mean... Um, so I haven't ever seen any, but to be very clear... Oh, the best way to avoid it so everyone gets something out of it. To, to be clear... In any of the games that I... Oh, Twitch has a character limit. Good to know. Mm -hmm. In the games that I've started that actually had a session zero or some kind of pre-character creation process, is always with groups that are very cohesive groups, which is another uh, another tip just in general, not just for session zero, but for all, for all of your time jamming, is to try to encourage and foster the idea of the group working together yes the gm makes the final call but the group working together to make decisions on on anything like rules or um rules adjudication everyone works together it's like what do you want to see do you think that this new spell should do 900 d6 damage because enemy wizards will definitely learn it if it does <laughs> um and then the group's like yeah you know we don't want 900 d6 that's probably a typo let's do 9 d6 it mm -hmm. is it is a second level spell or whatever yeah um so, having a, I've, I've always had groups that fostered a spirit of working together, and I'm guessing that the horror stories um, that were from groups that were adversarial from the get-go, but I'm not really sure, uh, because a, they, a you said that the, that the players wouldn't get into details about what the bad experiences were. I have a possible theory on that, and sort of like a... To, to try you to think get it's around. like you have well, to play the cleric. Yeah, exactly. I think I think that what probably what I could see what the main thing being behind that is uh, like I'd rather make my character at home is the uh, is somebody trying to pressure them to build or not build their character in a certain way, telling them what they can play, saying like oh I'm already playing this you can't play this, um, doing um, telling them how they can build their character, criticizing the level of optimization that they used in building their character. Um, trying to force decisions on them and things like that. And that's the kind of thing, like, if you see that happening at, at your session zero, you know, definitely, like, nip that in the bud hard. Because it's very important that each player has the choice to build a character in the way they want to build it. I mean, I did have a little bit of that coming up in my Council of Thieves game where there was a, a character who, a player was like, yeah, you know, I don't really care about, like, my, my feat selection or things like that. And then there was another player who was more into optimization who was like, 
like buzzing in his seat because he's like, ah, like you need to take all these feats for your rogue and stuff like that. And so, you know, like we had this conversation about it. And the we, first player just kept taking um, de like, deceitful, he, persuasive, skill focus. Yeah. And the other players were like, what about weapon finesse? You have 18 dexterity and 10 strength. Nah, I'll get around to it. Yeah, and so <laughs> I had to I had to mediate between those two players and sort of like, how are we how are we going to sort of work this out and, and, and figure things out and like I had a good conversation with both of them and then the like the the end conclusion to that is that like I think he I think he had, I think the player decided like, okay, you know what? Like I can see this is upsetting him. I'll take weapon finesse and then I'll leave all uh, have all my other skill feats and then I talk to the other players like, okay, you know, he needs to make his own decisions for, for, for what he's doing with this character and things like that. And then, you know, making a point to play up the strengths that character had because he had um he had both alertness and skill focused perception and really focused on being good at perception. So by by highlighting the ways in which his ridiculous perception helped the group, that also was, was both targeted to, at him to make sure that he understood and that his character was contributing and could enjoy that, but also kind of targeted the players like, ah, why are you making those decisions to be like, okay, you know what, the GM, the GM understands that this character may not be optimized as much in the ways that that you know the more optimizer player would want but that the gm is making sure that that character is going to contribute and be an important part of the team and is going to really boat drill down on ways to make sure that they that they shine so that was absolutely not a session zero issue that though. was absolutely not a session zero and issue. in fact but i think i think I, I, but I think, I think that it would have been good if i knew about that that was going to be an issue beforehand if i had figured that out i'm not even sure that you'll be able to tell that from session zero it depends on what your group's definition is the def definition we gave and even the way we use it would not have found out that problem because we absolutely do not have people collaboratively looking at the rules mechanics that the other people yeah. are, are are choosing during um during our version of it. It's more about making sure about the group cohesiveness and sort of the character concepts and the ideas um are of each other and not like let me look at your feats. What have you taken? Well, but, ah. I mean, it's not saying we don't we don't do that, but I, I, I suppose uh, the direction I come to this from is trying to think about like what could have gone wrong with Kitsune Warlock's thing, and then I was thinking, oh, you know, an earlier version of this sort of issue that I had that took place during session zero could very well have been what caused something like that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, it just depends. Yeah, if your group is overbearing in sessions there and they really do micromanage everybody's aspect, I think you're going to be more likely to have some issues. But um, to go back to continuing where I was question, which talked about Tui and the collaborative character creation, absolutely. The first step is create a concept. That's before the ABCs. And part of the co one of the ideas for how to create a concept is to do something that is connected to your group. So. The important part about session zero is to understand everybody's concept because to be perfectly honest with you, the person who had a bad experience um, in session zero, like group problems are group problems as well. They're not just like, well, we can't just litigate on this stream. Oh, well, that group was a bad group and this mm -hmm. player was wrong. It's possible that everybody felt bad about it, and that the other uh, group was that this player's like, oh, this is, let's say it was something like you should play the cleric type situation where they were at session zero, and the group and the player felt like the group for tried to force me to do what I didn't want to do, and then we talk to the group and they say we had this one player, and um, who came in, and um, we had a. A person who had already been there and had just right at the beginning said that they wanted to play this freehand style fighter. And then this person wants to play this swashbuckler concept that would absolutely be exactly the same thing, but more powerful based on what we saw and would just outshine. And we asked, could you play anything else? And they said, no, it's got to be the same thing as this guy, but better. And then I could see both the player being upset, like, why won't they let me play the swashbuckler I want to play? And the group being upset of like, why does this player have to play the exact same thing? So it could be that. Yeah, the point I, I think the point here is that you know group tension can come from a lot of different directions, and it's important to get all sides of the issue before. Like we obviously can't say one thing or another. We can just right. say like, hey, you know what? Here's some things that may have happened, and here's ways to resolve if those hypotheticals happen. It's in no way saying that we think that any of these particular things were the case. Right. 
in that player situation. And I would be concerned just with the idea that everyone is working together except one person. Yeah. I would at least want the person who didn't come to session zero or wouldn't tell anyone what they were doing to at least tell me, the GM, what they were doing, even if other people didn't get a say in it. So I could tell the people who were at session zero, hey, this other player couldn't come. I might wouldn't have to tell the other players that it yeah. was because they refused. Mm -hmm. And then say they couldn't come, but listen, they have an idea and they're going to do a bear druid. Just so in case, if I didn't know that, and everybody does a bear, too many people do a bear druid, or it's just something that doesn't work, like, they're, they're gonna do a, um, a barbarian who kills all nobles, and then, like, oh, the rest of the group is like, let's all be nobles! Mm -hmm. Um, then we have to, yeah, we basically, you want to make sure at least somebody knows what the, the mystery player is doing. It's also possible that you have someone who just doesn't want their stuff to be known which is something very very rare but i did encounter a player in um in college who just his opinion about life is he doesn't want anyone to be able to predict him anytime mm -hmm. and he feels like that it dehumanizes you if you if someone learns enough about you to predict you it was a very unusual and interesting viewpoint and he lived that 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 sort of philosophy and probably would be like oh yeah i want to do some things on my character in secret because otherwise people could predict me more mm -hmm. um and there are ways to to handle that basically of just like have that person convince that person to at least tell the gm and then say okay i won't tell them but unless it's going to be an issue for um an issue with the group um or something like that um, all right, let's see. So Rexa Liquid says, I went to what I thought was a session zero once, ready to build characters together, and the other two players had full characters already. That wasn't fun. So that could be another problem you have is mm -hmm. defining session zero. And seriously, this is an issue an issue of defining what we're talking about when we use terms. Like, we create names, the Rumpel still principle, we create them to gain power over a concept. Because, um, as my professor used to say all the time, um, if you know that the little plastic things at the tips of your shoelaces are called aglets, you can suddenly start talking about them in a different way than you could before you had the name for it. But the problem is when we define something and we didn't uh, actually share a common definition which, ironically, is what Session Zero is for. <laughs> if you don't know what Session Zero was going to be, then it can be a big problem. And in role-playing games, actually, it's this whole episode is about that lack of common ground and not knowing what something is. And anytime I see, like, in something, let's say I'm working on for even in, for an RPG book where, like, a new term is introduced, I make sure that that author has to define it. And I saw some things coming in from freelancers recently where it's like, yeah, this is never defined... And the definition I think they're using is not the one that I would have used for that term either. So we need to really make sure we define this term. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's all about, which means that you kind of have to make sure you define it before you go there. Or, yeah, you could have a really bad experience uh, like Rex Liquid did. That actually brings me over to another thing. V via the via the needing to have the via the chain of needing to have definition goes to of rules terms goes to needing to have definition of um, like canon terms and locations yes. and things like that and scenarios goes to making sure that you're providing your players with a baseline of understanding about the world that they are going to be going into. Now if you're running in if you're running in Galarian then that could then you could do that with like hey you know what or or you know another setting that has an established published book like here's you, you know you can give the players certain resources to, to look at but just even giving it giving them a good top level summary of like okay you know what you're going to be in this area this is kind of what this area is like here's the town that you're starting in here's what you know about the town things like that giving them some giving them lore to latch on to from the beginning is another good thing to have and the players guys do an excellent job oh, with sure. that for adventure paths but if you're coming up with your own adventure or you're you know you're running for running any adventure that doesn't have a similar type of thing um, giving them that sort of baseline from the beginning, and that really helps with the with the character creation, the session zero, all all of this sort of thing is knowing what the world but is. But you also have to know your players. 
because even some real dedicated role players and players who show up to your session all the time, I, I'm going to out our group on this. These guys have been playing for us since, um, like, later on when I was in grad school, and they're just still playing with us. Mm -hmm. And they come, like, a lot of weekends. We sometimes can play long games. But they're not going to do, like, almost anything in between sessions. I just know True at facts. this point that they're not going to. And it, Only I do. <laughs> if I, and, and some of them do read the player's guide because, like, but you have to make sure you're presenting this stuff that Linda just talked about in a way that you can trick your group into, into actually engaging in it or at least convince them to. So a player's guide, something that's put together like that, try to be interesting for the players, could work. Doesn't always work for our group. You can do something like make a, um, an in-world newspaper article that was like for the place where your homebrew game is going on with some art, little articles that it's just made to be um, just like a little issue with articles that's made to be fun to read and that those articles actually contain useful information that you want people to know so they feel like they're in the city. Find something that you think they'll actually read and be able to engage in because sometimes even super engaged players um, just they'll hit a barrier where um, this is the time and they will engage when they're here but they won't it won't be as easy to get them to engage in any of that that additional material mm -hmm. so using npcs and uh, other world events as a is a tool to convey information providing re reiterating what this is not session zero but reiterating the facts that their characters would know as they come up and continuing to reiterate those even if you think that like most of your players have got the point by now if you know that some of them may not have and uh including that in your summaries at the beginning of the session of what oh, happened last time and things like published that. adventures do that all the time in fact to the point that in like our last session gloriana marilla said a bunch of stuff and the ca the players just their characters are like why did she t why did you tell me this gloriana marilla like we know this some of the cases we told this to the person who told you <laughs> who's also standing right there and, and you're talking like lecturing about this thing that we told you and then linda said perhaps gloriana marilla has dealt with many very forgetful pathfinders <laughs> um in the past I, I actually said that in character because yes. my character had a had, my character's brother is a member of the pathfinder society so i figured that she may have heard tales of some of the uh some of the less attentive dunk to five int pathfinders who are not necessarily paying attention to uh to the details yep whereas to my players mm -hmm. like some of those things were major plot points that it couldn't have been more important also another reason she said that is that it's possible you didn't uncover the information that you guys yeah. uncovered but um the point is that you need to know your players as well and learning them in that first session helps do all the things we've talked about in a lot of other episodes for GM Tools before now. It helps you do things like um, even going all the way back to divinations when I talked about in the very second episode, making sure that PCs and MP that the NPCs are using like sort of um, divination protections that you might, um, that the PCs are sort of feeling are right, that they would use themselves and um, not like, wow, what is this? We're overwhelmed. They're using all these things that we didn't know anything. Or, wow, these guys are morons. Why aren't they using these protections that they should use? Mm -hmm. That first session zero can start getting you on the track. Like, our group expects the basic protections to be up on high-level characters. That's, my players expect that. They would be disappointed if someone who had the resources didn't have it. But some groups don't even know that there are any spells to protect against anything and they would be frustrated and surprised uh by that mm -hmm. so sessions there can be a good place to gauge and if you do want to use protections against divinations just to continue this example from the second episode to sort of introduce them to those protections in the in the game before they start seeing enemies using it maybe like oh you found a scroll of non-detection for you mm -hmm. like oh what did that do oh it protects you against divinations oh that's cool i didn't know there was a thing to do that so. And then they know that that's a thing, and then when they see it later, it's not like, oh, you cheated. It's like, oh, yeah, that's the spell I have, too. Yep. It makes sense that they would also use it. Yep, absolutely. So that's just one example, but this goes back to since Session Zero, or like just at the very beginning of a new campaign, figuring stuff out, can ramify deeply into your campaign, like whatever I was just doing there with a tree or mm -hmm. an octopus. 
Um, this sort of has its roots down into a whole bunch of the other episodes that we've um, given you guys so far. All right, so Linda, did you have, uh, I gave my tips that were not who, what, when, where, why, how. Did you have tips that were not in who, what, when, where, why, how? Um, I mean, I, I have, but I think we've sort of covered them in the ways that we've we've gone off into these, these various topics and that you've made a lot of good points here that are similar to things that I would have said. Um, so I, I think that's all that I can think well, of right now. Well, hold on. Unless... We promised that we would talk about um, what if your new session, what if your new campaign in an entirely new game system. All right. Such as Pathfinder 2nd Edition. So, yeah. So, we talked about that a little bit along the way, but let's make it a main topic before we end. Because Sounds that is me. sort of like the last thing that we were saying. Some people are going to be here for some PF2 goodness. We're not going to spoil new stuff about PF2 or anything on this stream, but we'll certainly talk about things that very few people heard that were still told out, like the Pathfinder baseline. Um, and we will uh, be happy to talk about what happens if you're starting your group with a new game. So whether that's Pathfinder Second Edition or you're just moving on to, hey guys, want to try out, want to try out Fate, um, or hey, want to see what's going on with the new Shadow Run or whatever you're gonna play. Oh, woo! Rex Luckywood has subscribed with Thanks, Twitch Rex. Prime. Thanks. That with that, um, we are one step closer to more emojis. So, um, regardless of what it is, there's a few things you have to do that are different than if you're playing with an established group and just starting a new campaign. But it is, in some ways, similar to starting a totally new game with people, which is, basically, you need to get people together, you need to explain to them about the new game if they don't know what some of the aspects are. Um, for instance, if you're playing a story game and you haven't before. I'll out my group again. Um, so, mm -hmm. I have played some super successful Fate slash Dreads and Files RPG games with, like, just Linda or, like, a subset of players that are currently in my current group plus the one guy who always took skill focus that Linda mm -hmm. was talking about from before. Um, and it was great. But at one point, I played with my full group and not the guy with skill focus. And... They are amazing Pathfinder players. They're creative. They come up with awesome stuff. They came up with all those heist things that I talked about in the heist episode. But man, that fake game was not good. Because they figured out like what their character was best at. And they were, at, they were just creative enough to be able to explain and claim that they just used that thing every time they needed to do anything. But it got ridiculously repetitive. Like I'd have an enemy try to do all these complicated things and then... Um, the, the person was like, okay, well, I do ice on it with my ice attack and mm -hmm. that, um, to stop it. And then every round that he would just do ice. And, and that's I, not like the, the and, and part of the point of those types of fake games is that you're, co you're constantly coming up with new and creative and interesting ways to do things. And you're not necessarily just like hammering on the most optimized thing you can think of to do with like your most powerful skill at all times. And, um, so Yeah. But a subset of that group was awesome. But, and it is possible it's also like the setting, because the, the subset group, they were just playing like out of their depth cops, whereas this group had some powers, but the more narrativist powers that you get are, admittedly, you don't have 15 different spells. Ice was the guy's power, so I, I maybe, some of the blame may be on me for trying to do a setting in Fate that that fake core said was okay but that um maybe i didn't do the fate stuff as well and i might not be as um as mighty of a gm in it as i am in, in in pathfinder but i've had it work before and i think it depends on your group so figuring out what game system will be good for a great a legitimately amazing group that just maybe not the right system for them and um that's going to be important when you're starting in a new system also, just going over some of the basics of the new system so that people can understand what's up, what's new, especially if it's a new edition of the system that you used to be playing before, to show people what's new, what's cool, um, that you couldn't do before, sort of guide their eyes towards some of that. Um, also, figuring out the people's access to the rules, like is everywhere, is there is there an online way that people can access the rules when they're outside of the session? You know, who's who has 
who has the books, like is it just the GM who has the books and things like that. So like when we were playing in a, a game of uh, a game of the strange right now with uh, with some with some folks from for some folks from Paizo and things like that. And we, we are we are playing we, we are playing with everyone who has ever been interviewed on RK Mark up to this point except Owen. Yeah, so we're playing with Ron and uh, oh yeah, you know them, Ron and, and Luis and, and Linda. Then, me and uh, and uh, Ron's wife Stephanie yep. and so we don't ourselves own copies of the rules and so we know that and we're gonna and then we plan like okay you know if we need to borrow the rule book from Luis has a copy of the rules if we need to borrow it we can do that or if we need to do things during the session you're gonna do that but it's important to know like does everyone have enough access to the rules to actually engage with what they need to do yep and we did not have much of a session zero so our strange game um, we had three spinners one vector and one paradox and actually, that three spinners is pretty cool because they mm -hmm. can help everybody a lot. But um, those are the three classes in uh, The Strange, and it's basically like three bards, one fighter, and one wizard-ish. Yeah. Although my wizard spends all of... It, it, if the wizard spent all of their spells on, like, mage armor and shield and stuff just to have the most possible AC. And, and then constantly skin. taunted everything to try to get everything to attack him first. Yeah, well, nothing can hurt me unless it ignores armor, and then it destroys me. <laughs> <laughs> and Linda's the fighter. So everyone except us it was playing um, the bard, which was kind of cool, kind of funny. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, when you're playing in a new group, you need to figure... Uh, in a new game, you need to figure out who has the rules. You need to figure out who knows the rules. Mm -hmm. Just like um, we were talking about all the way scrolling up about the experienced players and if they can help the less experienced players... Uh, without being overbearing, that's super important. Um, you need to figure out basically how you're going to interact. If it's a group that knows each other, if you don't know each other, you already needed to figure out how you were going to interact. Oh, Desna's Avatar, thanks for subscribing. And welcome to the ability to put up les Yay! leshies and, leshies uh, and, magic and wands. wands. And magic wands, yeah. So if it's a new group, you already don't know how you're going to be interacting with the new rules, but even an experienced group needs to think about if anything's going to change with the new rules, if there's something that they want to do now that they couldn't do as well before. And um, that's something that makes it a little more complicated, but I think definitely worth it um, to, to try out new games and... Um, just because you can, you might find out the opposite of what I found out with playing with a group with Fate, which is you might have a group and it's like, let's say you were in this, this situation, which is not related to me at all, but it's your f actual friends from real life. What? Friends that are from gaming from real life? Um, <laughs> you have friends from real life and you decide to... Gaming friends are real life friends too. And But you decide, but they're, but you decide, let's game with these people and they're like, hey, we'll game with you. And they game with your first system of choice. And then maybe it doesn't work. And you're like, that's too bad. I love hanging out with these people. Why did it not work? It's possible you'll have the opposite to what I had with um, moving into Fate with or Pathfinder Group, where you try a second game, and then it suddenly clicks, and everything works. And it's like, oh, it works. That just wasn't the right game to play with this group. And when, when you have a lot of different systems available, you just have a lot of different stories you can tell. And each system tells a story, and the rules push you towards different things. For example, Pathfinder 2nd Edition is more of a tale where you just get super powerful when you level up, and suddenly those giants that would have killed your entire party, you can just kill a whole party of giants with your character. Whereas, like, say, a game with bounded accuracy like 5e, or doing a variant of PF2 to, to make a, to, like, subtract level off or something like that, that's more like a story like when um, in that prequel to the prequel book of The Wheel of Time where Lan, who's like one of the best swords people, is attacked by like eight random bandits on the road. He's like, oh, these guys have been trained in weapons somewhat. Um, I have a very bad chance of winning this fight. It's just eight against one. It doesn't matter how skilled you are. Uh, and so you can tell those stories in different games you you can't really you don't really tell that story in Pathfinder 2nd edition without modding it because land would be like level 12 or 13 at least and those level 1 to 2 trained warriors they have no chance and in another in another direction from that too like the Call of Cthulhu type games if you want to if you want a game where 
the expectation is not that your characters are going to heroically triumph. The expectation is that your characters are going to see, like, how long can they survive, what can they figure out, and at what cost. So the, the mechanics and the underlying system can, can say a lot about what kinds of themes are going to work best for them as well. And Pathfinder is flexible enough that you can make it do um, a lot of different kinds of things if you're very... Um, if you're very clever about it, or like, for instance, certain horror type games don't always work as well out right out of the box, but horror adventures had some tips to try to make those styles of games work in Pathfinder. But then there are just some systems that have been built from the ground up to be great at that kind of story, and those can work well for your group. Um, so it's just important to like determine what you're playing. Like, if there's certain types of players that when you're playing Pathfinder would be an issue to have at the table together because one of them is like, they want easy mode, like yawn, auto attack with something and then everything dies instantly. And some players who want a challenge, but the, you know, the PCs win, but it's a, it's a tough fight. And, and some players who want like, this is a protracted tactical combat. And if I, that's going to take three hours. And if I don't do this exactly correctly, then things might go terribly wrong. Like right. there's, complete and that can cause an issue at your pathfinder table I've, I've seen all of those types of players but my goodness will that first person of auto attack and then we obviously win will they be like in a really bad place if they're in call of cthulhu or paranoia another example from mm -hmm. the chat or anything where it's just like yeah your characters die or how horrible things happen to them all all the time in this setting and that's just the way it works they will they will be miserable like, I was talking to someone online once who was mentioning that, like, his wife gets nervous when anyone is missing hit points. And that's why it was a, it was a discussion where they were mostly talking to other people about, like, why they thought that the ability to curb stomp in adventures could be important for some groups. Mm -hmm. When people often talk about, well, we, you know, we want an interesting challenge that, of course, is tilted toward the PC. And like, oh... That's not what that we guy, want that yeah. guy's wife didn't want an interesting challenge. If anyone was missing any hit points, she literally got nervous. Mm -hmm. And that would mean that if she was in a group, you could that would be something you would want to discuss because a lot of people do want somewhat of a challenge before they win. Mm -hmm. And um, that can be a big problem and that can be a big problem with the new system. So figuring out what is the story of the system and ultimately Pathfinder second edition story, the story that is in the mechanics is the story of Pathfinder First Edition, which is you start off and you're doing okay, but you get super powerful as you get up towards the high levels and can do some really outlandish things and save the world, save the kingdom, save the area against a really major threat and, you know, maybe run a circus that's very successful too. Mm -hmm. um, so figuring out what story you want to tell can help you select the game, figuring out what story your group wants to play, what kind of game your group wants to play can be super important. And that's also something you want to figure out right at the beginning when you're starting with a new game. And don't be afraid, even if your group, like not everyone knows these things about themselves that I'm saying. Like not everyone is self-aware enough to realize that any amount of challenge actually causes them to be stressed. That's good to know. Sometimes you figure this out, you try to do a session zero and it seems fine, and then you figure out, oops, yeah, we didn't know that this person actually, when they said they love puzzles, um, is the kind who loves them as long as you give them a few clues. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to course correct. Yes. It's okay to say, no, actually the system was the wrong system. Like we did when we tried to do that one off of fate. We're like, yeah, let's not do fate with this group anymore. Mm -hmm. That's fine. We didn't. We still play Pathfinder, um, etc. So it's okay to course correct. It's okay to decide um, to shelve something that's just not working for the players, and and you, uh, because you're if you're you are the GM and GM's tools. I guess if you're a player watching this, that's great too. You can help the GM, but GM is one of the players as well. Everyone's a player, and doing things as a group is the most important way to succeed. Mm -hmm. And I think on that note of uh, it's okay to course correct, like. 
you know, you're not going to catch, you're not, it's not possible, no matter like how carefully you engineer or craft a session zero to catch everything and to make sure that everything's going to be perfect. So just, you know, recognizing that, you know, you're all people who are working together to have a great experience together and keeping open lines of communication throughout, through Chess and Jira and throughout the entire process of the game and building a and building a sort of group in which people trust each other and can talk to each other is really the, the heart and soul of having a game that's going to be fun and satisfying for everyone and that's going to be able to evolve in a direction that's going to uh, that's gonna work well. Course correction anecdote for you guys to show that we've had to do it before. So, we talk about how players' guides are very helpful of getting people on track. That's become more and more true over the years, but there have been some players' guides that are unhelpful. For example, in the Council of Thieves Players' Guide, it tries to convince you to make, um, in, a, in a lot of ways, um, to make characters who are, to understand the reality of Cheliax. I mean, there's a few backgrounds, or sorry, traits that, um, that are a little bit more revolutionary, but mostly it's like you understand the reality of Cheliax. It actually, actually, sorry, the player's guide is fine, mostly. It, it gets, it, it's like you understand it, you're gonna fit in. But then the very beginning of the adventure path was the one that was like, so so we built these characters who were like, yeah, we're law abiding, but we care about West Crown and um, we want to save the day. That's what's said in the mm -hmm. player's guide. And, and here, first... here, here, here I am. A brand spanking new GM. Yeah, she's never first, run a game for anyone this, except me. I had never run a game for anyone except him. So I'm just thinking like, oh yeah, you know, this is a Paizo adventure. It's a published adventure. The player's guide says things and they've built characters with the player's guide and they've done their thing. So this should all work. And the player's guide was fine. But then it started off and this is the very first thing that ever happens in the adventure pass. So I'm not going to count it as a spoiler because mm -hmm. you literally, someone invites you to dinner and you eat dinner. And then she just rails off on a Hell's Re uh, Rebels style. It would have been appropriate to of Hell's Rebels. Like, down with House Thun. A West Crown safe from these shadowy beasts is one step closer to a West Crown free from the thrice damned House of Thun. And so we had been followed the player's guide, which... And by the way, the Adventure Path does not do that at all. It actually is closer to the player's guide and you're making West Crown a better place. Yeah. So all of our characters were like, "This is like, what we want to be." And we switching. were like, "Shh, like don't say that anywhere." There's hell knights, and then again, you guys, you, you get to make no decisions before this happens. So I'm just going to say it. It's the very first thing in the adventure path. And then a little boy runs in. It was like some hell knights saw me, so I ran directly to the base <laughs> where uh, to where you guys are, so they followed me. Um, <laughs> uh, and we were like. We said there's how like they're actually coming to this place with this this person with this crazy speech. It's like no, we're leaving. Mm -hmm. We'll just tell the hell knights what you said. I guess I don't. We don't want to get you in trouble, but you're like, we agree with most of what you're saying, but not the, this stuff. And she's like, so Linda, like you you knew that the hell, she's like if those hell knights take you, it doesn't matter. Yeah. That you didn't agree with me. She said, they're going to, they're going to, like, never let you go anyway. Yeah. So then we got mad at her, but we, we realized she was right. Mm -hmm. And we did sort of the thing we were supposed to do of running away from the Hell Knights. But afterwards, we were not really ready to join the group with this so, person. So, so, then, so then after the session, I'm like, oh gosh, that didn't go well. Mark, what do I do? Because, like, you have lots of GM experience and I don't. How do I, like, actually hook people back into... So I want to say... Do I need to create but, but, all new characters? You've skipped ahead, yeah. but... The session was actually really amazingly fun. It had this horror that, like, normally people have described in reviews that that first part is actually not um, not the strongest in the Council of Thieves path because it's sort of like, oh, well, we didn't have the dungeon, so just pick some things from this set. But everyone was, like, terrified, and I was a, a playtest summoner, and my Eidolon was elsewhere getting into battle, so, like, horrible... Call, like so marks of, that, yeah, of so injuries just, like, were just yeah. appearing on my character when I was doing the lifelink for yeah. no reason, and the people were freaking out. Yeah. Because they didn't know about there that. There was all these like sounds around the corner and all these other things going on, and like you thought you heard shuffling, but then maybe that you were just hallucinating it because of, you were scared, and then there was the sewer water and all the and other. And then hell knights showed up, and we tried to just incapacitate them and head off, but the gnome was like, "No, 
they, the dead men tell no tales and he killed them. And they're like, no, so it's going to kill the Hell Knight. Like, what's going on here? Oh my it god, it was a very, it was a very effective first session. But when we ended up, we did not want to join up with this person, which we absolutely had to do. So that's when we got to the point where, yeah. Linda, was saying, where Linda was asking me, and then so, like. I tried to ask people online about um, that that council theme starting hook to see if anybody else had any advice because I knew that the Paizo forums have very good advice about adventure paths in general. They're they're that the adventure path boards at least are very friendly boards with a lot of mm -hmm. constructive ideas. And then Linda just started bouncing off me for some possibilities, and like she looked later on is like, well, this person is not actually the leader of the group, and so like. She super emphasized that because they have a different leader who just was not there. And yeah. this person, she decided to change the group a little bit to just like everyone in the group thinks this person is is out there too much and more agrees with the PCs and that this person should like shut their mouth about how students so that they can actually do the yeah. main tasks. One player whose character got so traumatized that he said she could never adventure again decided to make a new character who was in the group already, who was the one with all of the skill focuses. Um, yeah. It's just like, yeah, that cleric is never going to, of Sean is never going to adventure again. I'll make a rogue who's a member of this group mm -hmm. and who is a little higher ranking than the rest of our PCs in the group who could convince us to join the group. And um, that actually was a very helpful way to, um, to, re to recover from um, what was a, an amazing session, but not an amazing launch to an adventure path. Yeah. Um, just because, and that's just sort of a known thing of that, because other people had the opposite problem to our group, where um, they read the same player's guide and thought, down with House Thune, we're just all going to be killing Thune, and then it wasn't. Mm -hmm. or, and then the speech was that, and they're like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then it wasn't, and they're like, why don't we kill Thune? Yeah. So um, expectations basically is what all this is all about and that is very important even past your zero session into the very beginning of a game to make sure that it works out yeah and thanks for bringing that up because i know i mentioned uh when we were talking about this episode that i wanted to bring this up I that's just... true you forgot yeah i forgot no it's all right mm -hmm. okay I, uh, yeah i was tired this morning and things like that so i wrote out that list of like okay let me organize this by who what when or what how and then mark can handle remembering the rest of the stuff i remember the other things all right so does anybody else have any questions or tips that they'd like to hear about for or issues that came up with their own games we've had a few really good ones from the chat so far such as consuming warlock's question of what about someone who has had bad experiences with pre-org um does anyone else have any if you do we'll be happy to answer it now give another um another little bit about that mm -hmm. and while we do we can plug for youtube because you guys didn't hear that um the next episode that will be up on youtube which means i don't have to give a date um is going to be about investigations and mysteries which is something we sort of talked about a little bit here in, in that some players do not like them and some players love them. And that is going to be a little bit talking about what players think and what they what they want, learning what they want about mysteries and investigations is this, is as important as structuring the mystery and investigation correctly. So when we talk about that, we can talk about sort of like different depth levels that you can get into from the from the like okay, you know, here's a few quick skill checks level to the, like, here's this whole giant thing. And, of course, we'll spend more time talking about the, the larger build-out because there's a lot more work that goes into a larger build-out than, than something that's based on, the, you know, a few skill checks. But it's, it's good to have that perspective in mind as well. Absolutely. And it takes not as much time to figure out what people want as it does to build a giant thing and then realize it wasn't what they wanted and yeah. then be like, oh. So, um... That's coming up. All right, it looks like nobody else has any other questions um, here um, about their um, session zeros and starting a new campaign. So for everyone out there who is starting a new campaign, going to start Age of Ashes or Fall of Plaguestone or anything else, in, especially in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, good luck. Let us know about how it goes when you do. And um, for RK Mark, I'm Mark Seifter. And I'm Linda Zeiss Palmer. Bye, YouTube. Bye.